and we're really grateful to be able to welcome everyone to the eighth annual Virgin Islands Caribbean Cultural Center, this time virtual symposium. We are looking forward to having a robust discussion with some really dynamic panelists that are going to share with us a host of information around culture, heritage, education, and much, much more. We're looking forward also to persons sharing with us their reflections on how best to move this conversation forward. We're attempting to make sure that we can make this discourse as engaging as possible. So we're asking persons to really share in their own networks as we go live on Facebook to really highlight exactly if you want to go quickly, you go alone. If you want to go far, go together, right? So this is streaming at VI Triple C 365 on Facebook. Persons can tune in um, at their leisure. We're also expecting a few other guests that are gonna share with us some of their robust engagements around the themes of heritage education and arts legacy, the VICCC Recovery Project, which is sponsored in part through Global Giving that serves as our donation base. We're also going to have a discussion around the VICCC in general and our ambassadors, some of our advisory council members that will be most eloquently introduced are here with us, as well as some of our serious corporate and non-governmental organizations that serve as supporters. We're also going to have some connections with persons that are sharing with us around Caribbean studies. And the fact that today is the fourth day of Kwanzaa, the principle of Ujamaa, cooperative economics, there's no telling exactly where this conversation will really go. But we know that it will be a very robust, engaging, and supportive discourse so that we can really bring truth to power in a variety of ways. I was so excited about what I'm doing here, I overlooked to even start my own version. So voila, we're happy to be joined by everyone. I want to first and foremost thank all of the panelists that have tuned in and offered their support. You know, I'm going to start at the beginning. So I want to make sure I at least say everyone's name so we're clear on who's here joining us. We have John Clendenin. Yay! We're going to do formal introductions in a moment. We have Director Yvonne Peterson. Yay! We'll do some more introductions in a moment. We have Dr. David L. Horn. Yay! We're going to get some more going on in a minute. We have Cleo Mary Aboot Jarvis. Yay! He's joining us as well. And we're also being joined by Olasi Davis, and I'm sure he's somewhere between the bush and technology. So I'm hoping that Olasi Davis will tune, chime in when we ask him at that appropriate time. So yay! This whole symposium, this is usually held in the month of, of April. And just because of the realities of this pandemic that has impacted each and every one of us, we were unable to get everything together and organize for April. What we did do in April is just make sure that we survive our virtual semester at the University of the Virgin Islands. So for persons that are tuning in, are not familiar with the VICCC, this is the 90 second version and in between panelists, I'll share some other cogent points. The Virgin Islands Caribbean Cultural Center has been part of the College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences since our formal in our formal engagement on November 9th, 2012. We've had the honor and privilege of focusing on culture, yes, heritage, education, archival work. We actually now have museum collections and a pretty extensive set of art collections that are from within the Virgin Islands and the wider Caribbean. We continue to do professional development and research around Caribbean studies. We're working very closely with the social science department at the University of the Virgin Islands to work on the development of a PhD program in Caribbean studies. Yay! 
So we're really excited about what's going to be coming forward with that. And additionally, just helping students, faculty, administrators, and the wider community just be engaged and more proactive around all things linked to Virgin Islands Caribbean culture and making sure we see the interdisciplinary foundations of Virgin Islands and Caribbean culture in all aspects of life and engagement. So we're very excited about being able to share that bit of information as well. One of the things that has been our ongoing discussion and not so much a challenge, but something that we have to weigh in on all the time is how do we continue to be sustainable? And how do we continue to be a viable component, not only at the University of the Virgin Islands, but in the community of the Virgin Islands and with our partners in the different organizations of which several are here. So that's gonna allow us to also speak to some of the things that we have brought together um, in the advisory council that has worked very closely. Most of the members have been with us from 2012, even if they weren't formally on the advisory council, they were still providing advisement, support, recommendations, expertise, fund development, and a lot more. So I do wanna recognize the two advisory council ambassadors that are here with us, as I mentioned earlier, Joe, Brother John Clendenin and Dr. David Elhorn. I wanna thank you very much for making time to even share with us this particular <laughs> moment so that we can have this conversation. I'm pulling up the slides for Professor Clendenin. So I wanna at least share his bio as offered with, to us. Professor Clendenin has addressed thousands of people internationally while public speaking, delivering conference keynotes and developing workshops for business professionals, international organizations and governments. The first half of John's life included serving 25 years in the United States Marine Corps, international athletic competitions, coaching as a sports psychologist for the 1984 Olympic team and running for the US Congress. John retired as an executive at Xerox Corporation in 1998 and joined the senior faculty of Harvard Business School. He was recently senior associate dean of postgraduate education teaching online courses for Instituto de Empresa, i.e. in Madrid, Spain. His research work is multicultural leadership and involved the development of leadership traits and principles for effective trade facilitation and internet infrastructure development. John is the founder of Inner Circle Logistics and the Supply Chain Centers of Regional Excellence. I like that SC core on the score. He was first selected for a listing in Who's Who in the World in 1995 and in Who's Who in Science and Engineering in 1998. He was awarded a US patent in 2006. Anyone want the number, I can easily give it to you. John is an author of books, articles, and haiku poetry. He lives on St. Croix in the Virgin Islands with his wife, Bonnie, and spends the summer season in the Adirondack Mountains of New York. They have three grown children, Trevor, Stacy, Ryan, and nine grandchildren. So I'd like us to welcome Brother John Clendenin. Yay! All right, thank you. And I will pull up your, um, your slides in a moment. Okay. So while she's putting up the slides, what, um, as a brief introduction, what I, what I thought I would do is as we look at our viability as a cultural center, and because we're part of an educational process and a uh, uh, institution, uh, and because we're involved with this uh, COVID um, uh, pandemic uh, globally, uh, I've been asked uh, on different occasions to help with um, uh, education in general, with uh, graduate level education, and also now with uh, children uh, my first job, uh, I think was mentioned, I was a kindergarten teacher in the Bronx. So I've taught everything from, uh, you know, three and four year olds through uh, doctoral uh, students. And I think that what's important is that if we can uh, start uh, looking at the, the process of learning itself, because if we can do that within the context of culture, 
which is what I uh, focus on, I think we can really add value uh, within the University of the Virgin Islands and uh, elsewhere as we go about our, our business. And what I, what I wanted to do was uh, take some of the work I do as a sports psychologist and uh, you know, uh, in, in metaphysics and look at uh, what has been learned about the, the knowledge itself and how it applies to uh, learning and teaching uh, online classes. So if we go to the next slide, uh, Dr. Chen. Absolutely. Yeah, so this is a little bit about uh, me, but you can skip that because we uh, I said about that. some of it. I <laughs> try to follow no, no. instructions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's there, and, and you can have these slides, by the way. But basically, um, the notion is learning from mastery and how, and uh, I'm using the, the techniques developed by uh, Dr. Benjamin Bloom in Indiana University many, many years ago, and he has a revised taxonomy that I have adopted to online learning. And, and so that we can uh, look at the process of learning itself and particularly within the context of, uh, of culture and uh, multicultural aspects, which I do. So I've been uh, teaching uh, this in uh, different parts of the diaspora in India, in China, in Brazil, but uh, most uh, directly involved in uh, the Western, uh, South, uh, Western, uh, or excuse me, uh, yeah, Western Africa in the uh, ECOWAS region, uh, notably in Ghana and in uh, with the uh, Ashanti tribes and uh, the Igbo in Nigeria, but also in Eastern Africa, in Uganda and uh, in Kenya, uh, looking at how governments uh, use the learning process of learning about the people that they represent and the different aspects, for example, in Kenya with uh, the uh, uh, Nakuru region with the uh, Maasai and the Samburu, and then in uh, Kenya, uh, in uh, Nairobi with the Mau Mau's and the Kikuyu, and then the nine Islamic tribes that are in, uh, in Mombasa. And to actually get across this notion of instead of just presenting the details, the facts that we hope for people to remember about our culture and our heritage and things, but to go more in depth about what is the learning and how we can, um, can achieve that. So. These are aids in teaching the principles and concepts and a theoretical nature that I think that in the VIC we can deploy and then uh, some some precedents and uh, uh, look at that. So if we go to the next slide. What uh, we're talking about specifically is the cognitive learning process in uh, in learning and education and also explaining what where we stand as a uh, an institution within an institution at, at UVI. Uh, next slide. So it's really about uh, not just the uh, the answers that the uh, that the uh, instructor or the professors give; it's the questions. And so what I'm proposing is that it's our perfect questions that are important, not just the answers that the students give, and that their answers connote a different level of learning that we need to attend to, and that we need to be aware of in uh, in our teaching. Uh, and so when we look at if we um, have our students become the producers of the knowledge within themselves in, the, in their inner circle of, of thinking, that is a, a different capability than just uh, presenting them with uh, information. Uh, next slide. And uh, particularly when in online, when we learn from each other. So what we are looking at is that uh, how do you when, you, when you don't have them by the short hairs, you're, you're not there in the classroom and they're all in a remote uh, circumstance and they interact, how do you uh, create the diaspora of learning where it's not just one-on-one -on -one sequentially between the instructor and the pupil, but it's how do the pupils uh, engage with each other and share their experiences and then uh, create this, uh, what we're calling learning from mastery. So the steps in the six levels that Bloom talks about is uh, remembering, understanding, applying, analyzing value and creating that those are different stages of cognition and the, uh, the learning that takes place is different if we understand that's what we're trying to achieve. And I think by adopting this type of paradigm, particularly in online learning, we're able to in, in fact change uh, the conversation. And I would suggest that even in the administration 
of the university and how we deal with, how do we recognize? It's not just these are the facts that uh, the ICCC uh, has and delivers, but do people understand why it's important and why these things are, are happening? And can they apply the learning of the culture in their daily lives? And how do they analyze the fact that they know something different about their history or their culture and evaluate that for creating uh, change and different beh behaviors? Uh, next slide. So if we look at the first part, it's uh, just uh, asking the students, can they recall information? And so when we're teaching, let's say at Harvard in the, uh, 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 the case study method, uh, people that can regurgitate or just give the case facts, or if you're working with your students, you've been asked to read this material, you've been asked to study this thing, and you give it back, either you recognize something in a multiple choice test, or you list it or describe it, you're retrieving, you're naming things that somebody has asked you about a great person or an event or something has happened like Fireburn that's here in the, in the Virgin Islands. And the role, what I've done in the slides is to sort of break out uh, for our use is uh, what are the uh, professor roles? And uh, by the way, this comes actually the, the derivation of this was uh, when I was the, uh, the senior associate dean at IE, uh, I would train the new faculty on how to teach the case method uh, and how to uh, actually teach. Because as we uh, found out, particularly internationally, uh, the process of going through and getting a, a PhD and becoming, you know, knowing more and more about less and less as we go through had nothing to do with the teaching methodologies that they did in early childhood or in secondary education when you went after uh, how do you create syllabuses and the learning experiences and all those pedantic things about teaching. So I wound up having a group of PhDs that would try to get hired by IE to become professors but they actually had no idea how to teach. They knew their subject, but they didn't know how, how to teach. And so what I put on the right side here was to tell them specifically, this is what the professors are supposed to be doing. And then in the same aspect of where we are in the stage, what the student role is. So in here, for example, it's directing the conversation, telling, lecturing, showing, giving you know, uh, examines, the students to see if they have this knowledge and ask questions and then evaluates how much they have retained in this remembering phase. And then in the student response to uh, absorb and remember and recognize and memorize and retell, this is the fact of the story. So next slide. So, but in the learning for mastery, the real question is, yes, the students could remember what we taught them, but did they understand it? Did they really understand the idea or the concepts? And so that's where we go in depth and start asking them to interpret or summarize, paraphrase, classify, compare, uh, have a discussion about the understanding of what is this that happened? Did you, under, did you really understand the implication of slavery and what's happening and that process, the economics of it, why people are doing it? And, and that's the, the process of, did they, they understood that it happened or if it's a lynching, whatever it is, but, but do you understand it? And so that's where the professor can demonstrate different things, listen to their, uh, their, uh, their reflection of what they remember and then have the students by the questions you ask them, explain different aspects of it, describe it, translate it, interpret what that meaning is. Next slide. So then it becomes uh, in the perfect questions that we ask the students. And uh, what I am suggesting is that we in the IEEE uh, C develop the questions that we want to ask people about culture and, and, uh, uh, and the center. And that we don't just want them to remember what it is. We want them to understand it and to understand how we're applying that into our community. So that's where by asking the right questions, the learner makes use of the information in a context different from where it was learned. So we're not just a different department in the university. How do we actually apply what we're doing to the everyday life of the community and carry it out? And that's where Dr. Chen or the others, we, we show, we facilitate, we observe, we organize, 
We ask questions about what our role is, what our position in the university, our visibility, and we use it as the students by asking the questions that allows them to solve problems within their uh, field of learning and to demonstrate to us the use of the knowledge of what we've taught them or compile and interpret, you know, and, and construct that. So it's the, the understanding and the interpretation. Uh, next slide. So then we go into exploring with our questions the, uh, the analysis of what it is that they are remembering and understanding and presenting. And so that's when the professor with the questions probes, guides, she observes or acts as a resource. She asks questions and organizes the sex, the roles. And that's where we get the students engaged in the analysis of the, uh, like slavery as we talked about before, or the use of uh, uh, symbols or drums or dance. And do they really, uh, by having these interrogatories between and among themselves, uh, argue and debate and think more deeply about the subject uh, that they're engaged in. And so it's the different questions that we ask that probes the student to analyze what we told them and to understand. Uh, next slide. And excuse me for going quickly, but uh, all of us are, uh, are able to absorb this quickly. So it's just me uh, introducing these concepts uh, that you probably already know. So the next step is in evaluating and saying, can you justify a particular course of action? And so if we're looking at those things, how does the learner make decisions based on the in-depth reflection of the evaluative uh, process that we're asking them? And again, in, uh, in the student evaluation, particularly at the graduate level, it's not just the answering or participating in class. If you participate in class and for example, you just give us some case facts, yes, you participate and you talk, but that's different than making the contribution of analysis or analyzing or, or questioning and participating in a debate. And so the students then learn over time that you are uh, engaged with them about the, the learning and mastery of the subject, not just do you remember what the subject was about. And that's when we uh, look at can they justify and we as professors uh, clarify or guide the discussion and we look at them to actually make judgment calls or dispute somebody else's. They critique, they assess, argue. And uh, that's when we're monitoring and we're detecting what's the in-depth understanding that they, uh, that they have. Next. So in the, then the last part is creating. And so if we look at the, I, uh, the ICCC, uh, can, do we create a new environment of learning that makes us different? And when I say us, the University of Virgin Islands, are we cre creating a, a learning atmosphere and mastery of culture that creates new ways of viewing things and ourselves and, and our place in the, in the world? And so that's where we take the information that we've learned about our past and our culture and say, now we are empowered. We can do things and have new ideas and new information based on what we've learned. If we have this terrible legacy of slavery, what do we now do because of that and respond to the universe and, uh, and create value? And how do we design or construct or plan or do new things based on that rather than uh, wearing the, the badge or the scars of the past, we are able to create new information and pass a risk and modify what we do. So I would suggest that when we look at the VIC that we are looking at how do we use it and the learning and the culture and our teaching to create a different way of our students and the faculty and the advisors and the university and create different ways of uh, proceeding. That's it. I can't hear you, Dr. Chen, you're on mute. I was, I was screaming, so I needed to be mute. <laughs> I, I just want to thank you for, you know, running down the, the technique. I said I needed a strategic plan, so thank you. That goes, you know, that kind of bro broke down a formula that we could actually implement starting January 4th. So I appreciate 
that you shared this with us. I just wanted to kind of roll back so people can get it all at the same time to really kind of understand what was really narr narrated here. And I really thank you for like bringing this up in a way that we could utilize. What I would ask before I go to the next panelist is just, is this something that you see that we can do in a year? Is there like, what would be the first step to implementing this type of strategy uh, within what we're doing at the center? Because a number of things have transformed. There's a number of other components that are being introduced, as I mentioned earlier. There's components inside of the College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences, particularly the Social Science Department on in terms of graduate studies around Caribbean studies. There's a focus as well with us establishing a more formal relationship through MOUs that's part of the strategic plan of the University of the Virgin Islands, particularly with the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of African American History and Culture. As you are aware, most of persons on this call on this Zoom meeting, conference, symposium, all of the above are aware of. And then there's the communitarian piece that we do in terms of providing professional development, whether it is for K to 12 educators, whether it's to do certain orientation pieces with our existing professionals, not only in the Department of Education, but also at the University of the Virgin Islands to provide culturally sensitive and cultural competency activities and programs for military persons that are new to the VI and the Caribbean, as well as just persons that come here to work, live and engage. So they're like several layers of what we do in addition to our exhibitions and our archives and our research and our publications. So what, with what you've shared, what would be, a, is it something, what could we do in the next three months? Right. So I think it's important that um, what I'm sharing is an overlay of the process of learning itself. And, it, and it's not a, a program or, or something like that. It's just changing our, our, our concept. So I'll give you an example in the Marines when we use mastery learning. So we say every Marine is a rifleman, okay? Now, one way of teaching the rifle is that you, uh, like what they do, for example, in the Army, and no disparaging uh, <laughs> comments about my uh, fellow uh, veterans of the, uh, of the Army, but they send them to the rifle range for a week, okay? And at the end of that week, they fall out on a normal curve. Some people are experts, some people are sharpshooters, marksmen, and some people aren't qualified and they don't get to wear the badge. And that's how we sort of teach. If we're teaching Spanish, for example, uh, we teach for a six month time period. And at the end of that six month time period, we then evaluate how much have you remembered and you get an A, a B, a C, or D, and sometimes they, uh, they force a curve upon the professors in order for doing the teaching. In the Marines, when you go to the rifle range, once you master how to shoot well at the expert level, then you can leave the rifle range. But if you don't master it, you don't get to go uh, to the next level because we don't accept that you're not gonna have mastered that particular skill. So it would be like if you're taking Spanish one, Maybe you have a cultural background in Spanish or maybe you could test out of it. So once you master Spanish one, then you go to Spanish two. Mm -hmm. And it's time that is the variable or understanding and people need different things. Some people need more time. Some people need coaching. Some people need a pat in the back. Some people need a pat or a kick a little bit lower to motivate them. But the issue is learning for mastery. So if what we're trying to do is to have people master culture and the offerings of the center and to master their understanding of our art and our heritage, that's a completely different thing than to say, we're gonna present it and then some people will get 80%, some people get an A, some people get a D and they'll be able to say, oh, I went through that program or that course. So what I'm suggesting is if we change the nature of what our expectations are in being exposed to the center and reorient how we think, how we present our grants, how we are engaging the university. It's that engagement that I'm thinking that we can do immediately. And it's not something that, oh, we all have these steps to do in three months. It's saying, 
do we or, or do we even want to do we, I mean I'm, I think everybody can understand what I'm uh, putting out but the question is is that it takes more work on the professor's part to segment their questions and their answers rather than just saying it remembering is that okay here's my multiple choice test I'm putting it out there you'll know what uh, red green and black means and you'll know these kinds of things and what year did Rosa Parks do X, Y, and Z and what was the Civil Rights Act of 1965. And if you remember those things and Benjamin Banneker, uh, you know, uh, laid out the, the city of Washington. But yep. the implications and what that happens is, is different if we are engaged in how do you master the, the notion of culture and okay. how are we cultural people. And I think that's for all of us to reflect on and saying, how do we do that in our, in our, in our work? But uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm introducing when you had spoken with me, how do I think I could contribute? And I'm thinking in the, the work I do in multicultural organizations and how to think about that, uh, that's what I'm engaging. And I'll give an example. I was in uh, with El Sisi in uh, Cairo when uh, he t took over and they were, asking me to come in to help them with the development of power. And he had put 16,000 uh, uh, of the Muslim Brotherhood in the jails. And that's how he uh, was doing the, uh, not unlike some of the things that we're trying to do in this country. But uh, the, the notion was, how does he create an environment to move Egypt into the next environment? What I did was I bought um, a students that were Egyptian from IE, uh, we had 40,000 alumni, but Egyptian students that lived in London, in Brussels, in uh, Stockholm, in Beijing, in China, in South America, and brought them into Cairo. And, I, and they worked for the top 20, uh, you know, Booz Allen and McKinsey, and for, uh, you know, IBM and, you know, Facebook and Google and all these different multinational companies. And I work with them that says, how can they work with El Sisi and give their time, not money. How can they give time to uh, the organizations and shadow different members of his cabinet to give the knowledge of how do they do things in multicultural ways and understanding out, out looking at people. So the idea would be here is that people that understand our culture to be, let's say, shadow people with um, Governor Bryant, that we have all these Virgin Islanders around the world can they come back in and help with um, those things because of their in-depth understanding and knowledge and mastery of what it means to be a Crucian in the world itself, as opposed to being in our in the unanimity of our environment uh, here. And it's the same thing with the university, saying how do we take this notion of people like uh, ourselves that are around the country and have different experiences and bring that together so that the student has the ability to master based on our mastery, rather than just learning the five things that uh, Dr. David Horn wants to present, and as if that was uh, who we represented, and we're all so much more than that. Mm -hmm. Over. No, well, thank you for that. I, I, I appreciate it because it, it provides another layer because each of the panelists that have been invited has been asked to bring their own skills, talents, and expertise to the conversation so that when we're speaking of these things and we're working on how we're taking the next course of plan of action, that is a very collective, very cooperative, very comprehensive and still sustainable approach, right? So I really appreciate what you have shared. So I'd like to um, humbly and honorably, you know, thank you. And I'd like you to navigate some other comments that you would share later on in, in this symposium. And for those that are just joining us, just keep in mind that the discourse is around persons that have shared their knowledge, their wise counsel, and their analysis as well as assessment of how the, we address culture, heritage, and education, and some other themes that are alongside in terms of things that are linked to either the International Decade for People of African Descent that the United Nations designated from 2015 to 2024 things that are linked to this year, the 2020 being the 30th anniversary of the American Disabilities Act that most persons didn't really know was really celebrating its 30th anniversary. The fact that this is a time where the University of the Virgin Islands being the only historically black college and university in the Caribbean 
and a land grant institution has really expanded a number of, of its degree offerings and certification programs, especially in light of what has transpired with the COVID-19 pandemic affair, transforming how instruction is done. So I just would like to kind of put that in there. And then also some of the other partnerships that the VIC already has, and particularly um, I'd like to introduce now, and this is the sister that I can introduce just about at any time because I have observed not only is she a double, and she might correct me and say a triple UBI alum, she is also the director of the Virgin Islands Developmental Disabilities Council, which really addresses some really powerful engagements of inclusivity in terms of the inclusivity that's essential for persons that do have disabilities, in addition to being involved in advocacy and doing it very organized. She is also one of the founding directors of the Beyond Vision Foundation, one of the first nonprofit organizations that really embraced and completed the national certifications in regard to the standards of excellence that everyone is now kind of clamoring for. She also serves as a federal reviewer of various grants and programs, you know, as an evaluator amongst other pieces. And in addition to all of this, she's also a very powerful and engaging artist, like a painter that she's real quiet about that one, but we were very fortunate at the VIC to get one of her paintings. So we're very grateful. And she has served as one of our, her organizations that really worked with the VIC from our inception. So that every year we've always done either a symposium, series of conferences, work on cultural competency, and a variety of other things. So I do want us to welcome Sister Director Yvonne Peterson. Thank you, Dr. Chinzira, and everyone. Good, good afternoon. Um, I have a probing question uh, to Mr. John Clendenin. Are you related to the Clendenin in St. Thomas and St. John? I am. I'm re related to all of them. Our family came in 1790 uh, and uh, from uh, uh, different places, uh, but my particular string from uh, Bernard Gustav Clendenin and then my father Olga Clendenin were in uh, uh, in Gallows Bay, and uh, then uh, they were sailors and sailed on the vigilant back and forth and and woodworkers and cabinet makers. And then the other part of the family were jewelers, and that was Monroe Clendenin, and those. And then uh, they split, and two brothers went to St. Thomas and Beef Clendenin, and then the ones in St. Uh, in St. John. So we're all over the place, and with the Macintoshes and the Peterson and the McFarlands and uh, you know Jackson, so that's us. Okay, well, my mother was a Clendenin, yeah. and Big Clendenin is my uncle. Yeah, no, no, I know, I know about you. You know, you may not know <laughs> I me, know. but uh, <laughs> I, uh, I know you. <laughs> okay, the no, uh, so I'm surprised you already know. Okay, <laughs> okay, um, first I, I'm, um, I'm. Thankful for Dr. Chen to um, invite me to this symposium. Um, I'd like to let you all know I've been I'm in Zoom meetings at least two, three times a day sometimes, so I didn't have a lot of time to prepare. But I did want to talk about the issues of cultural and cultural competency on the private nonprofit sector. That's where I spend most majority of my career, and also in grassroots and underserved populations. And to prepare for this, I looked at what the characteristics of, of culture was, and I focused on, we talked about language, religion, cuisine, social habits, music, and arts, but also about growth. I focused on growth. And I think that when we look at a culture, we have to look at what is the value and the strength of growing our culture, and what does it really mean, um, and whether or not, uh, what is the intrinsic value of our culture. Um, I work with individual with families with various disabilities and special hair care needs. And what we always do is to, to teach them to tell their stories. 
And the story that I always remember um, when I was at UVI, I, I used to, I was the president of the community students. So we used to raise money so that the people in the community and at UVI and the professors can, we can uh, visit other countries, other islands to learn about their culture and how they operate. And I never forgot the, the time that I went to Haiti and to visit the Citadel, which is a, the big fortress up on the uh, highest mountain in Haiti. And that was built um, by Pema Henry Christopher, which was between 1805 and 1820. And it was really to resist um, the French. And from going there, uh, you could stand on the Citadel and look down to see where uh, they expected Napoleon to come back to try to capture Haiti again. But the thing that really struck me was a little boy who was about nine to 10 years old. Um, we met him up the mountain, it, two, it took about two hours to reach up the mountain. And he lived in a house with just some sticks that are about maybe two inches apart. You could just see right inside the house. Some, you know, a dirt floor, um, a little um, coal pot, and the corner and some mats um, and blankets, I guess, for sleeping. But he knew, he could tell you everything about the history of the revolution, the dates, the names of the generals, when, how, what happened, when it happened and how it happened. Of course, he was, you know, waiting for um, his contribution by some tips, but the fact that he knew it and he was so proud of it and I never forgot it because it, um, I didn't know much about the history of Haiti besides just um, reading the books, Mascavado and Mandigo, I used to read those books. And I was able to remember one of them that I read that was a fiction, but it was pretty much tied to the history of Haiti's revolution. And from that, it, it, you know, it really it stuck to me and made me think about for this here, how many of our young people even know about uh, our history? Uh, for me, and for anyone, if, if, if we really want to embrace and revel in our culture, we have to know our history. And I need to see how we can make sure that that history is known, not from, also from the, the uh, university level, but throughout the age of our young people as they grow up. And that way they'll be um, really embrace our culture and be able to, to you know, revel in it and be supportive of um, what we do in, it, in the territory in reference to culture and cultural competency. I was telling Dr. Chen, um, when I was growing up, you know, it was supposed to be the better eight o'clock, but I don't know why, but my father would allow me to stay until 12 midnight so that I can hear the, um, the VA um, national anthem. I just loved it for some reason. I would sit down there and listen to it and it allow me to stay late. And I think, I think back and see how to have impact on my feelings. I think it did because listening to the song and the, 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 the lyrics to it made you feel that you're proud to be born in the Virgin Islands. It was special to be born here. Um, so special that I one time thought that we, we here was where the, the, um, the, uh, the Eden of, Garden of Eden was. I was very small then in, in kindergarten, something like that, but I thought so. What I'm saying is that um, we need to, to me, in, in reference to how do we make sure that we bring the VI and, and we try to teach the VI history and how do we make it happen and make it and what vehicles that can be used that will be consistent and sustainable. Because if, if, to me, we don't start from a young age and embrace it and get them to um, appreciate our culture, how would, it, how would it really be sustainable? I have a friend, every time she, she talks about St. Croix, she talks about the history of fire burn and how her great uncle was in the fire burn and how he had to uh, run away and escape for his life because of something having to do with the fire burn. And she says it with, with, with very proud. My, my grandfather, my grandfather grand was in a fire burn. And I started to think you know, more or more thinking about what the fire burn means and how can we make sure we capture that people who are here now 
to memorize memorize those kind of things so that as we move on through the years as the kids go we, we have more of a um appreciation to our culture and i think that's that's a real uh, to me a challenge and i see that in in the public housing communities in the grassroots who not all finish school and not all really uh, understand or even have the history taught in the schools right now so i my i my recommendation is to make it into a broader aspect. Um, Dr. Chen and I are part of a building a nonprofit coalition, and that was um, initiated after the hurricane and recommended by FEMA so that we can have nonprofits who are um, sustainable and have the resources so they don't depend on the local government for funding. And, I, and from my discussion with her, I feel that part of it should be any organization that um, get funded through this nonprofit coalition have certain public policies. And those are policies may, may, should include how do we engage our youth? How do we provide them with experiences so they can understand and they can um, appreciate the, uh, the culture outside just the classroom, but also if we with what we, uh, UVA Cultural Center, you know, how can we do history tours, things like that, that should be part of a public policy for any organization here in the territory. Whether you're doing an outing to uh, the uh, Maroon Mountains, or you do something within um, the Frederickstead Fort, things like that. I think that's something that we need to see how, to me, how we can make sure that those needs for cultural competency is, in, is embraced and becomes institutionalized from all levels um, within our, our four children throughout the years. So that's basically my little piece. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Thank you, Director Peterson. Thank you, Director Peterson. See, this becomes important to all of us because we're trying really hard to see how we're navigating how to do this with the support of persons like yourself and others there's, there's a very wide net that's being shared so that we can do this very and i'm going to keep coming to these words cooperatively comprehensively collectively and definitely with the discipline and the structure that allows for us to implement it and then have what I'm seeing in the chat, and I'm going to ask her to chime in when I at, at any moment in terms of how we get that the stakeholder buy in that that seems to be the term that persons like to use. So I, I really am, am grateful. As I asked our one of as I asked John Clendenin, I'm going to ask you a similar question. So some of these things are the things that we already do with the Virgin Islands Developmental Disabilities Council. And of course, the change in 2020 made us have to settle and simmer and transform how we just started to do things so they were more virtual. Around cultural competency and the things that you've recommended so that it's for the wider community, how much time or do you have a recommendation of what we can start with in January 2021? what would be one of the first things that you would suggest that we do, even if it's something that we've already done? Is there something that you would suggest, Director Peterson? One of the things that, I mean, right now, for example, I'm starting a program in January called, um, Is My Life My Responsibility? And it's actually um, sexual risk avoidance program. And we seem to think, and this is based on the children that I think that the way we are, our, our carnival is, the culture gives a different, you know, things of behavior, what is negative part, part of the, the, um, the culture. One of the things I was thinking is how do we um, involve or make sure that activities, I know from the private, uh, public nonprofit center is engaged with um, UVI Cultural Center, that some of the things that we do is part of the programmatic 
part of, of our program. And we're doing it both at St. Thomas and St. Croix. And we're actually going into public housing communities um, to work with the parents and the, the, um, the young kids from, the, from 10 years old to start bringing in them into um, maybe doing, like I said, doing outings that involves um, historical walks with historical heights and also um, programs or videos that, that engage um, the culture of our, our, not only our territory, but others. For example, just yesterday, I ordered the video about, I think um, the first um, black, one of the young girl who was the first one to be integrated into the, um, the, the other school, the white school, remember uh, that, that, that I saw that history that we just bought, I just bought some of the books. I just bought, I bought some, a couple of the videos so I can put them in all the different communities that I'm working with to make them understand uh, the struggles of, of, of that we have from way back then and the struggles that we have now and how do the struggle in, in, in grace with what we're doing here in the, in the VI. So I think it's, it's by engaging the students in their various ways where on my level to get them involved with, with UVA triple C through program activities and implement them as part of the program. I hope that helps. Perfect. Thank you. No, I'm, I'm, you know how I multitask. So I want to make sure I get the yes. point and because I'm, right. I'm jotting down a couple of things as you say this. Did someone else say something? Yeah, Dr. Yeah. Ten, I wanted to ask uh, Director Peterson a question. Yes. Yeah. So um, what I'm in, in listening to you, what, what I'm struck by is how do we, uh, as we address culture, um, and we introduce these uh, notions, how do we um, distinguish what's not culture? So for example, we're teaching what they should know, but how do we get people to unlearn things that they think are culture that are not? And uh, I'll give you an example, like, like in Kenya, the, uh, the only time people come together and, uh, and think that they are, um, um, uh, they are, um, uh, Kenyan is at the Olympics because otherwise they're tribal. They're like I'm uh, Mau Mau or I'm uh, you know uh, Maasai. And so when we look at uh, in Hawaii, for example, I, I lived there for five years. They have a Polynesian cultural center, but the identity of being Hawaiian with the music, with how they do, is distinctly different from being Tahitian or in from Samoa or any of the other cultures and they have a Polynesian cultural center and everybody not, not only knows what it is to be Hawaii and to live there and have the spirit of aloha, but they also understand and in their birth certificates, I'm Chinese, Japanese, uh, Korean, you know, and they list all those things as separate and distinct. So if we're here and we're learning culture and I talk to young people they think that part of our culture is the adult parade and walk up. And, and I try to say, you know, going down the street with a boom box and blasting your music is not part of our culture and it's rude and uh, it, it should be extinguished, you know, just from my personal view. But the point is, is that we are in a multicultural, multi-Caribbean place here in the Virgin Islands with multiple uh, black cultures and how do we distinguish as we teach people more and more about specific things that are, let's say, Virgin Islands, how do we get away from the, uh, I'm Frederick said and Christian said, or you're St. Thomas and I'm St. Croix, or we have these things that divide us as opposed to joining us together in, in culture. So it's, more, it's, it's tied to what I was talking about, about mastering the notion of who we are as opposed to just remembering certain different Thanks. Over. Yeah, that we, I'm glad you said that because uh, just about a couple, maybe about a month and a half ago, I had a discussion with our um, people who are more on the managerial level regarding the same issue. Because I did a focus group with, with young children, young adults, you know, youth, youth between the ages of and 15. And they brought up the issue of the carnival. And they said that their 
take on it was our virgin, the VI condones teen pregnancy because of the way they behave in the parades. And some adults felt that was um, insultive. And it, 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 was, it gave us a chance to open the discussion. Again, I said, I think I hinted it on in my discussion about culture, about our behaviors, and to really put, put in values on what, what it means to have um, the culture and how do you uh, recognize it when it's not a value of a culture. For example, as I said, how they um, behave in the uh, in the carnival parade, and we need to start. You know, one of the things we're going to do is we do is we, and we talk to the families on the grassroots level to make them understand um, behaving like that way. And looking back at the history, um, it wasn't about uh, walking up and jumping on the ground and this kind of thing. It wasn't that. I showed them where it came from and, and make them understand that that's not. That's not really culture. That's just that's just bad behavior. So I think we need to do it on, on, on a grassroots level, so we can start making them uh, understand, um, changing the mindset of what it means to be um, a Virgin Islander. I think that, I guess that's my small take in it um, mm -hmm. to, to 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 make them understand that. And I think we have been able to do it with the young people because um, they were able to say that that. It's hard for them when they're grown ups and not setting examples, and they use exactly that, the parades, as their example of why we need to start taking more attention to what our children see and what we expose them to, and what are the, the messages and the signals they are getting that, that promotes other uh, negative behaviors. Well, I want to thank you for that. I, I want to thank you for that because that's. There's a lot of layers to that question, and that could expand to a full day retreat slash charrette slash strategic planning program, because that's been something that the VICCC, we actually have hosted symposia in St. Thomas on the eve of food fair for Carnival and invited ministers I keep saying ministers, you know what I mean? Commissioners, representatives of VI tourism, education, et cetera, to have that discussion. And in previous years, we attempted to do it, let's say like in January, leading up to the carnival on St. Thomas in April and May. And there was a certain amount of resistance only because of the same place where Brother Clendenin posed that question. How do we get that clarity on what is culture in the Virgin Islands to then define that? And one of the ways that was suggested was by bringing the elders, the cultural tradition bearers that are elders, the cultural tradition bearers that are youth, the young millennials, quote unquote, and what I call the millennialettes, the ones before them, and the senior millennials that are really after the period of, you know, because millennialism kind of changes depending on who you speak to, but to have that gathering so that we can have that discussion and to have that versation. And now with the, with there being a larger number of younger representation, younger representatives in governance and in nonprofit organizations, this has been a conversation specifically in sectors around arts and culture or cultural creatives that we've started to have and it's met with some success. The fact that 2020 we had no St. Thomas Carnival, no St. John Festival, no St. Croix Christmas Festival outside of the virtual activities, it gave persons an opportunity to pause and to have these conversations with action programs of what it should look like in 2021. And that, so there's some things percolating in that regard. And I, I'm, I'm really grateful for that discourse and I wanna to move to the next panelist so we can you know, go all the way around. So again, this is a person that is served and it's very easy for me to do an introduction. I really wanted to do the CV version but I realized that would take a bit of time. However, an elder in the Pan-African community, 
engaged in work with the African Union in terms of international organizing work, you know, from various, the African Union, Universal Negro Improvement Association, African Communities League, retired, I believe, sort of, from, <laughs> as a full professor at California State University in Northridge, bringing a lot of truth to power around the Pan-African Diaspora Union and all of the different organizational entities that really support an understanding of international public policy, regional and national public policy, at all types of international ambassadorial training and programs, and a really cool father, a really cool Baba and elder. So I really want to I hope I've covered some. It's a very small portion, <laughs> but I hope I've covered some. And I'd like us to welcome Dr. David L. Horn, another one of our advisors for the BICCC's council. Thank you, Dr. Kahina. Thank you for the learned presentations made by my colleagues. In fact, your presentations got me to move slightly away from what I was going to present. I am going to send to you right after the program a quick summary of a general definition, a general theory of culture. Since VICCC and long live the VICCC is focusing on how do we preserve how do we teach about, how do we identify with, how do we get appreciation for the culture of the inhabitants of the Caribbean, then what the hell is culture? Our color is not our culture. Our church is not our culture our sense of who we are in this world right now is not our culture. Culture is who are our people? Where are we from? What have people who look like us, what have we done to contribute to the world in which we live? It would be great if culture were simply collaborative, cooperative, connective, but culture is competitive. Culture grew out of who controls the resources, who controls the distribution of how we, of how people live. And so once we got a domination by certain groups in terms of the resources, then they impose their culture on everybody else. They, in fact, teach their culture. We have been trained as African folk to essentially serve and help and support those people who dominate the resources on the planet. We have been taught that we have not contributed anything of significance. We have not invented math. We did not invent history. We did not invent science. We basically have been taught that our culture is to follow other folk. Clearly that's a lie, but if we don't know what culture is and what our culture is, we basically continue living the lie from the culture that dominates. I don't want to get into a full Pan-African discussion, but what I do want to say is that the young folk who act up, who basically embarrass some of us with their loud, raunchy, misogynist talk, with their continuation of calling themselves niggas and other 
negative terms. They are simply repeating what they have been taught because culture, the dominant cultures are taught through education. One of the biggest weaknesses in Africa, for example, right now is the continual usages of the educational purposes, tactics of the colonizers. In 2020, 2020, predominantly in Africa, they are still teaching the education taught to them by colonists, that the focus of being African is to serve white folk and that all of your countries and all of your resources should be focused on how do you bring value to the dominant culture, to the dominant European culture. That is something we must change. And one of the things that the VICCC is focusing on is how do we instill in our youth and our people who must continue looking at our culture, how do we instill in them our culture, our history, our places on this planet did not begin as servants. We are the first people on the planet. We are the founders of all culture. We may have lost our way, but we have still made major contributions. We did invent math. The Egyptians who built the pyramids, the Sphinx, they did not wait for white people to show up to teach them pi, to teach them how to build great stone monuments. They built those on their own. They invented the math that they needed. We spend too much time training our young people to lionize to make heroes out of white scientists, as if we did not contribute to all science and math. Our culture is not servitude. Our culture is not what we have not invented. We have been made victims of and have accepted the victimhood of being dominated by other folks cultures because culture is competitive. That was the example of a history professor in the 1960s, I think Levy Brule, if I'm not, if I'm not uh, mistaking his name, who was giving a lecture about world, world history, who was giving a talk about the greatness that some people have achieved. And one of his students said, well, Professor, nowhere in your presentation did I hear about Africa. What has Africa contributed to the culture of the world, to the continuation of progress? And the learned professor said, well, in Africa, there's only darkness. Darkness cannot be the subject of history or of culture. To simply say he was wrong does not even come close to the damage that that did because we are still continuing to teach our youth that we came from no place, that we have done nothing of value except to follow other folk. Pan-Africanism, and I've been trying to, not to get this way, but culture is not only competitive, culture is political. Culture talks about who is and is not in charge. We are African people. We have been African people. There are in the Caribbean 
indigenous folk too. As African people though, as people of the drum, as people of the, of the family, we must teach our youth that they have a value that they must continue to promote the value of progress, the value of moving forward. We may not have anything to do with how we got here. We may not have any choice in how we were born or where we were born, but we most certainly have a choice in what we leave here, what we do here. So as Pan-Africanists, and Pan-Africanism has to be a part of what the BICCC is involved in, we must teach our youth that you are from a people who have achieved. You are part of a continuing legacy of folk who figured out what to do and they have done it and they've done it again and they've done it again. We are not a culture of failure. We are not a culture of servants. We are a culture of African folk and we will reconnect the African folk on this planet back together so that we can reclaim what we should have always had. The dominant culture that teaches the world how to cooperate, how to work together and how to move forward. Otherwise, when they die, those other folk, they're gonna take too many of us with them. We should not follow only the dictates of other folks' culture. We are from some place. We do have people. We do have those who, who have contributed. We should have in our educational systems all over the Caribbean, the scientists, the mathematicians, the inventors, we should talk about what we have done, not just what they have done. We should not just learn about how we can follow other folk. The function, the purpose of the VICCC is not only to preserve Caribbean culture, but to train and to teach the young folk who must carry us into the future that they are from somebody, they are from someplace, they have a history, a culture which has no home is no culture at all. We who are the teachers must make sure we never forget to show our youth, you are from someplace and you will always be somebody. Hotel. Hotel. Oh, wow. Thank you, Dr. Horn. Thank you, Dr. Horn. So you're hard to ask questions because you like present in a way that like I almost feel like I'm just doing a comment, but I got one. So similar frame, you know, thank you for expressing how important it is for our youth to be reminded of their greatness and the legacy that they're a part of so that we know that would shift a lot of things. It would shift how they yeah. engage in education, how they embrace culture, how they behave right. at carnival festivals. Because this is a very serious issue here in the right. BI and it has spread even within Caribbean, you know, other Caribbean nations and states and republics. And it's been a conversation amongst the CARICOM youth ambassadors, as well as other heads of state, you know, other representatives of CARICOM, heads of state and otherwise, so that the cultural expression is truly grounded in something that is respectful, that is positive, and that right. is, you know, really pro, pro human. I'm gonna put it like that. It's not something that just is a, a celebratory talent show of 
like you said, other people's culture. So right. I want to, to highlight the, my question to you is around what are, again, in the next three to six months, what would you recommend as being one of the first or shared courses of action that we can actually see some degree of, of success with, right? I'm not trying to big, bite something bigger than what we can handle, but what would be one of one or two of the fir first things you would suggest? The contributions of African people in the history of science, mathematics, and technology. We must impress upon our youth. You are not from a hole in the ground. You're not from badness. You're not from negativity. You are not from the worst of humanity. You, in fact, are from the very best of humanity. You are from the creators of humanity. We must change that. We must change what is being taught to, uh, to our young folk. And look, every youth in the Caribbean should be able to have a conversation with you about what the Ishango bone is or was. Every youth should be able to tell you about black scientists, black business people, black agronomists. They should be able to tell you about those who have made contributions to humankind. It's not what Beyonce is doing. It's not what T.I. or any other rapper is doing. You need to have a foundation from which you can grow and you can produce. We have not done as good a job of teaching them the positiveness about us as opposed to the neg negativeness about them. We have not done as good enough of a job of that. And so I would recommend the history of the African, African contribution. Well, I appreciate that. And, and I appreciate that you highlighted that because just yesterday I downloaded again the African civilization collections that were done or led by Dr. Sheikh Anta Diop. Right, physicist, engineer, linguist, and you know, out of Senegal that impacted the world, work with UNESCO, and that collection is available online. And there's teaching material that comes with that. There was a curricula that was utilized with support from ancestors like Dr. Asa right. Hilliard, Dr. Amos Wilson, and others um, here in the Caribbean some of the work of Dr. Didicus Jules at the time where he was over the CXC examination, you know, council, along with his work within the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States and CARICOM, et cetera, you know, he, right. he and others, you know, and I mean, there, there's several, there's Sister Queen Tempu Nefertari, who was instrumental to the development of the Mabalozi teacher education program in Barbados that spread within the Caribbean. You have work by Dr. Humphrey Regis, originally out of St. Lucia, right. around this very powerful Pan-African, global African, grounded in Kemet, Nubia, Kush, information and research and publication and content so that it was palatable for, of course, academics slash administrators, professors, faculty, et cetera, available for university students. And it had portions that were designed to help elementary, let me be very specific, pre-elementary all the way to what is considered secondary level of instruction. And then we know that there were curriculum that Dr. Asa Hilliard and others left, Dr. Bobby Wright, we could go on and on with the Institute for Positive Education, the Institute for Black you know, independent schools. There's a right. Roots school, a charter school in, in the Maryland DC area. The work is being done by Professor Brother Obi 
Egbuna the second, I mean, there's like a number of layers of, of information that we could use. So, and, and I know you're, what you have shared and prepared in terms of just helping people to know how to conduct meetings, how to make meetings functional in your Meeting Ma'at publication and these elder council manuals that are, have gone through and literally percolated a whole new level of how we deal with councils of elders, councils of youth, and everyone in between and before. So right. I, I'm, I'm grateful for that suggestion. So I'm just getting our task list together so that when January 4th hits, we can like drop the boots and run. You know, I'm, I'm putting on our conferences <laughs> yeah, right. for this, you know, collectively looking for the support from each and every one of you. So a sister queen mother, who I affectionately always call Moot and Moot, an educator, and an archivist, a library technologist, library scientist, par excellence, the organizer beyond most organizational engagements, a phenomenal cultural creative as an artist, dancer, playwright, poet, songstress, and you know, after retiring after more than 30 plus years service to the New York public school system in a variety of areas as an educator, administrator, librarian, et cetera, you know, really pulling work together. We know her internationally as Kwanzaa Mama, you know, and I'd like for us to really give a warm welcome to Sister Queen Mother Moot and Moot Cleo. Mary Boot Jarvis. Well, wow. oh my God. I was like, Who, who's that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. This, uh, wow. So, uh, thank you, you so much, Dr. Chen. How'd you get on the ceiling? <laughs> <laughs> no, you no. There? You see, no. You, okay. From your perspective, I'm on the ceiling, but my ceiling, uh, my house looks like a, a, a Merkut. Mm -hmm. um, a pyramid, so my ceiling comes all the way down the side. I, I don't have I hardly have any wall space. So you're looking at the ceiling, but it's like I don't know how could I do this. See the top? I, I can't do it because I'm on my phone there because we I'm, we're having a, a windstorm. But it's like a, a a pyramid. Yes, it is. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. So so you're seeing actually my wall behind me, but it's it is part of my roof as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Chen, Dr. Chen <laughs> asked me to be a part of this because of a statement I made, mm -hmm. and um, I'm going to just kind of expand it a little bit um, to why I am African American and not Black. I, I went. I, I'm going to personalize it, and hopefully, my story will. Um, inspire other people to um, claim their ancestral home, um, Africa, as well as where they live, the Americas. I'm, I, you know, I always apologize, start off by apologizing to the youth um, because um, many of us as elders, we drop the ball when it comes, especially to this generation. We really drop the ball with them. Um, we, we weren't as vigilant as we should have been in protecting their minds and their hearts from outside influences. And I see their confusion. I see their lack of trust. I see their um, love of things that, as some of the panelists said, are detrimental to them and our culture. So I want to apologize again to our youth. We are so sorry. Some of us are trying to make some corrections now. And as you have heard, there's some plans on the way in connecting intergenerationally um, the knowledge and the wisdom and getting your input into what you want to see going forward because you are the future. And we want to make sure that you as a stakeholder in the future understand where you're going 
understand whose shoulders you're standing on, understand whose footsteps you're walking in and know how to navigate from there. And you can make your own choices, of course, we're individuals, you're gonna make your own choices, but you're gonna make choices based on information and knowledge, not based on feelings only. So on that note, I get off my Kwanzaa Mama soapbox with that. And on that note, I'm going to talk about African-American, the term, because there's a lot of confusion um, about that term. The idea behind African-American is to connect Africa to those who have roots in Africa. It's not for everybody. Don't get, to, don't, don't get it twisted. It's not for everybody. It's for people who actually know that their ancestors come from Africa. Then you come back to the Americas, the definition of America, because some people have co-opted it, the term America, as their country's name. It's actually a nickname for them because the Americas are a couple of continents, right? North America, South America, Central America, all Americas. And then there are people who live in those places who have African ancestry, whether by, whether who were brought to this part, some were brought and some came on their own. Not everybody was brought here in, the, in, in slave ships, okay? So folks need to understand that. Not everybody was brought here in slave ships, but let's deal with just the people who were brought here in slave ships. You still, like Queen Mother Moore used to say, if you put a cat in the oven, when you open the oven, you expect to see baked cat. You don't expect to see biscuits. So when you take Africans out of Africa and put them in the fire of enslavement and kidnap and rape in what is now called the diaspora, you cannot expect to be anything but an African, you know. But okay, let's 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 <laughs> let's get to the point where people were taught to hate Africa, were taught to that Africa was the dark place, were taught that nothing good came out of Africa, were taught to 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 I want to know. Call somebody an African in the 1950s or early 60s, you were ready for a fight. Call somebody black in the early part of the 60s into the 70s, you were ready for a fight, okay? Because those two terms were made to be negative by the dominant culture and everybody was taught that it was negative. So looking at Africa, and I'm talking to my people on the continent. We really would love for you to understand that we are a part of you. And I can prove it just by, just by this statement. I don't even have to get paper and pen to prove it. I'm just gonna tell it to you. In Africa, there was some collusion going on. Of course, there were the dominant cultures that came and kidnapped people, et cetera, et cetera. And I have millions of stories about that. But if there was no collusion on the ground, they wouldn't have gotten that many people out, okay? <laughs> so for instance, give, give just, just one little example. If I am somebody who's greedy and I'm looking at the Igwe, and the Igwe's family, the Igwe is the king, the ruler. And I want that throne. What's the best way to get rid of the whole family? Gather them up and sell them to the slavers. So the real people who are supposed to be on the Igwe's thrones in Africa, or those rulership thrones, their descendants are actually over here because they were captured and sold. Now, if you have a prejudice about somebody who was abused, captured and sold, and you want to uh, have a prejudice against them and say that that makes them less than, I have a problem with you. I have a problem with you. 
So you need to understand that our people are one. People in the continent of Africa are one with us. We are one with you. And so African-American ties us together. We're part of the Americas and we're also part of you, Africa. And I hope that we can come together. Many of us are already on that path. We already love each other. We already speak to each other on a daily basis or a weekly basis or a monthly basis. But when religion was used to conquer Africa and the rest of us in the, in the Americas and all over the diaspora, when we, and when the imagery of our deities were changed to look like our conqueror, and we bow down to that image of our conqueror every day. I, I, I'm like, we, we, have, we have a problem. We have a big problem that needs to shift. Because until that shifts, where we honor ourselves and understand that piece in the, in the, in the holy book where it says, um, God made man in his own, his, his, his own image. God made man in his own image. That's the, when I was a little girl, that, that resonated for me. I'm like, but I don't look like those people. <laughs> I was like, I was like, they show me the picture. I said, but I don't look like those. I, I, whose image am I made in? And that, that's a lot of the incongruency and the disconnect that folks are having with themselves and loving themselves and knowing that their, 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 their self is powerful and more powerful, even more powerful than the people who are dominating you. You can't, you can't believe that if you're bowing down to the dominant culture image. Uh, I think I think I talked enough. I'm, I'm, I can get on the soapbox forever, but I think I talked enough. So that's my contribution. I'm African American. I ain't black. <laughs> so there you go. Thank you very much. <laughs> you know, Mary, you we navigated around a couple of things because I'm going to pose a question to you, right? Because I want to thank each person in a in a very creative and innovative way around just bringing these different perspectives and points and places of analysis for us to speak around Virgin Islands Caribbean culture, hmm. recognizing what this space brings. And I would ask of you, particularly because you have been here before, you know, you've got family in the region, you know, multiple islands, and I'm would love to know again in the next three to six months what would be your recommendation of what the vi triple c of course with a collective base right of, of participants and engagers what would be your recommendation of what we could do and reach with some degree of completion in the next three to six months let's say between yeah between january and june 2021 well, first of all, let me just say, I was born in Antigua. I left when I was about eight going on nine. So, and I, and I visit, as you say, I have a family still there. So I, I understand or understand some things um, on a deep level. Um, with regard to the presentation that was made with Bloom's taxonomy, um, I'm, I was, some of the revisions were really great because I, I, I revised it a long time ago because it didn't it didn't fit some of the things I was doing. Um, and, but I don't tell people when I do that, I just do it. And <laughs> so some of the, the revisions were great. I really like this version of Blooms better than the other one. But um, speaking of that, you know, one of the things that really destroys as, as a, I'm also a curriculum specialist, so I I trained teachers in New York City public schools for years. And one of the things that I found in training the teachers, one, we don't give them time to digest things. Two, we don't show them what they already know. That's a part of what we're trying to present to them. So they feel overwhelmed, like they got to throw everything out and start from scratch. And that's not the case. So I always start with showing them Okay, you already do this, 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 and this. Okay, let's talk about how we can implement this part that we don't do. Um, and that, that gives them buy-in right away. Oh, okay, I don't have to do everything. I just have to do this little piece. Um, then, you know, you, you look at learning styles. Everybody doesn't learn the same way. 
some people need to hear it five times. Some people need to touch it. Some people need to smell it. You know, so what kind of differentiation of learning do we provide for the adults? Because we think of that for the children, the little ones, but we forget that we all are learners, lifelong learners, and our learning style doesn't change much. Um, so we need to um, actually take time to assess all of that. Um, and I think planning is key because, and, and you need to bring in a broad representation of the stakeholders and, and only you know who the actual stakeholders are in the institution. And when you do that, um, use the model of consensus and listen to everybody's voice and listen to their concerns and come up with a way to address those and then bring more people in. It should be a gradual phase in. It can't be, okay, this is our new thing and here everybody, this is what we're doing now. Yeah. That's why we fail. Yeah in my opinion, in my experience, mm -hmm. okay? So um, I, I think it's wonderful. I love that presentation. You know, as an educator and a, and a trainer, I was like, yeah, oh, yeah. But the stakeholders might not feel that way. Or not, let's say most, most of them might feel that way, but there are few. And when you have those few dissenters, they can wreak havoc on your, your program. Yeah. Yeah. So, and especially depending on what position they hold in the organization, they can destroy your, your, it's a beautiful idea, everybody likes it, but then they can interweave their negativity and cause a whole bunch of problems. So diffuse that at the outset and make them have input into the process. Mm -hmm. well, no, I, 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 uh, did Dr. I make Shen? sense? Yeah. Okay, um, thank you for sharing that, Cleo, Mary, Abut Jarvis. Yes, yes, brother. Okay. And so, then yeah. Uh, so a couple of things. Well, first, let me back up like uh, uh, Ms. Peterson. The, uh, do you know uh, Dr. Linda Curtis Bay at the city of New York? She was in uh -huh. charge of STEM education there. Anyway, that's uh, that's uh -huh. she's, so she's uh, yeah. she retired after 30 years in the chancellor's oh, wow. office. And, uh, and, yeah. uh, so Linda, she's now uh, yeah. the head of uh, wow. education and training at the uh, uh, the Museum of Natural History. So she's still here, and I've been trying to get her to come home to the Virgin Islands, uh, Dr. Curtis Bay. So anyway, so um, anyway, she should. She yeah. needs some sun. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> but what I what I wanted to talk about a little bit and tying back to what uh, Dr. Horn had talked about was the the culture of culture and 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 just uh -huh. uh, give a, a little uh, the way to think about it so whether you're white or black or african or you know uh crucian the the notion that i've been studying uh the, when i've been in africa is uh when i've talked to them about their culture and so what i and i'll, I'll give an example there's a culture there of current africa that's different from the the history of uh, the people in Africa. And the current Africa, their learning has taken place, their ontological reference is of colonialism. So mm -hmm. when they learn about the colonialist, no matter where, what part of it was, that they learned that when you have power, that power, when you're, when you're the overseer or you're the person that was granted uh, land or titled, you know, cause you're from England or, and you get that land, that you're unable to enrich yourself because you're there independent of your competence. And when you come to the Americas, if you're the governor general of Cartagena, well, you're not there because you are the most competent leader to be the governor. You were put in there for some political reason and our family background. And the same thing with the hierarchy in the military in the Spanish Armada, the leadership was granted by privilege as opposed to earned. So that ontological reference of privilege and being able to uh, in, uh, in Ghana or in, uh, in Kenya, let's say, it's our turn to eat in political um, uh, parlance and the sugar boat. It's because when you get into power, the learned cultural behavior of colonialism is that if you're in charge, you get to extract that thing from your, for your family and for your posse that's in power at that particular time. I think that what I've seen or observed when you come into the Caribbean, 
that culture of privilege and of colonialism is rampant in the Caribbean because we come from also a colonial background in the, uh, in the Caribbean, different from the Americas. So when you look at America, the ontological reference, and that is a white reference of privilege about everyone is created equal. And uh, uh, the, the whole thing that the American, the, the United States people, the Republic resisted against uh, Europe and said, we wanna be different and we're gonna have our constitution and we're gonna have these ideals. Those ideals are very different from a colonial uh, reference. And so what, now we didn't participate in it, but the feeling of white America, let's say, is one of a different fabric of entitlement and earning your way and pulling yourself up, you know, all of those kinds of things that's that reference. So when I look at what we can do in the Virgin Islands Cultural Center, I think very much our political diaspora is one that comes from colonialism. It says, if you get to be a senator or the governor, it, it's, your, it's our turn to eat. And we come in in power and we have this understanding that it's okay to enrich your family and your because you have power, but that's a that's a, a colonial culture that we have to try to get against. And when you see it, when we try to come up with what's our constitution or what's going to happen here, uh, we fight against the cultural shackles that are on us. That are the same shackles when I talk to people in Africa trying to throw off their shackles of colonialism because they can't relate to their African leaders as David was talking about. They have the same problem because they have the shackles of how, what they learned about and the examples that they say in their communities of what happens. And it's the same thing as what I say, our examples. So we have examples for our black youth, but they are the athletes, okay? And they're the musicians and the entertainers that they see that sometimes have bad behavior that we don't want them to emulate. And so somewhere where we're looking at going from just these are facts or these are uh, really cool uh, African inventors and princes and uh, rulers that we need to understand and emulate. There's a lot of bad things mixed up in there that we also need to understand and differentiate in some sort of cognitive way that says, who are the people we need to learn about? So we have, I think, all sorts of people now in the internet and inventors and people that are in the 21st century are doing wonderful things, but they're not on a Pareto frontier of what the black youth are able to see. So yes, they could understand that uh, some great African ruler is part of their heritage. But to me, the culture of center is going and saying, who are the people that we now have as good examples in our community and in the United States and Europe around the world that they can see whether they're a painter, I could be a painter, I could be a mathematician, I can be a teacher, I can be uh, an executive, I can be a doctor, I can be all sorts of things, not limited by, I have to somehow figure out how to be this example that, that we have. So it's, it's really a question that when I look at it, I come from lots of multiculture. That's why I talk about multicultural leadership. And I just, I'll end with uh, a story about the Marines. I spent 38 years and 26 days as a United States Marine officer. As a retired colonel, I mean, you know, so people look at Marines and they think of the people that crawl in the dirt, the, the, the infantry among us. But the point is, is that, you know, our culture of once a Marine, always a Marine, Semper Fidelis, we don't leave anybody behind. You can see a Marine and look in his eyes and a Marine is gonna take care of the brotherhood and the sisters that are, are US Marines. Now we learn that in 10 weeks in boot camp. We learn that Marines don't surrender. We learn that Marines have integrity and they have you know, all of those kinds of, of, of things and traits and no Marine abandons those things once he gets the Eagle Globe and Anchor. So how can it be that you can have a culture of Marines and you know us as you see us wearing our hats and different things and no different from being in a sorority or fraternity and being one of the Q dogs and people that walk around. We know how to adapt to a culture and we know that we can train it. 
So what is it that we can do as a Virgin Islands triple, I, you know, BI triple C that we can do in the next short period of time that says, uh, how do we take Cleo's knowledge about curriculum and things and how do we defi de define and promulgate what is the culture we want to see? How do we envision what is it we want our youth to do and to take away and how do we want them to act and perform? And if we have this period, the slow between parades, it's shame on us if we don't come up with criterion and things for the parade that says, you know what, we're not having it anymore. We're going to do this. And when we start going back out to bars and restaurants, we're not going to act crazy. When we go out in the street again, not just wear your mask. It's like, don't play your music this way because that's not part of what we're uh, going to tolerate. But uh, uh, to me, there is some really interesting implications about learning and that we can do. And so I'm very much aware when Dr. Chen said, well, how do you apply this to the VICCC? I think we need to think about those things and come up with something powerful that we can do and we can present and we can lead by example. And that uh, Dr. Chen carrying the mantra actually has something that says, look, we want to do X, Y, and Z. And if we do those things, we're not going to hold up in high esteem the people that uh, have guns and weapons and shoot everybody. Because we're here and look at all the time we spend on this, uh, this COVID-19. We have twice as many murders in the Virgin Islands in the last in 2020 than we have people that died from uh, from COVID-19. And we stopped our business. We stopped our economy. We don't have people going anywhere because we're trying to do something and limit the amount of deaths. And we had 23. But guess what? 44 people were murdered. And somebody was killed just yesterday in St. Croix. Well, you know, why is that part of the culture that we'll accept when we're fighting with uh, whether or not we can ex uh, accept the disease and, and treat each other and, and wear a simple thing like a mask. That's, that, so there's, there's really fundamental things that we, there's, an ur there's a sense of urgency as a Crucian elder that, you know, I'm in my eighth decade now. I'm, I'm done. I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, you know, uh, not where I'm supposed to be trying to lead the charge, but I still have a little bit of energy. And when, uh, you know, Dr. Chen, you know, goes in a wood pile and, and extracts me from my farm and say, okay, it's time to, you know, to, to go back out there. I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I'm, I'm with Dr. Horn. Uh, all the people in the here that I can see, I'm saying, let's go do this because we, we have the ability to make a difference and what we do is important. And uh, that's what I wanted to leave with is that this panel, this symposium of saying, how do we reinvigorate ourselves? Because it's not that, uh, you know, my brother's over there in, uh, on the left coast, way over there in, in, in California, <laughs> but, but we're connected <laughs> now. We can, we can do something because we're together. So, so let's, yeah. uh, let's do that. I got my, my cousin, them. Uh, we, uh, you know, let's, let's just figure out a way how to support Dr. Chen and, uh, you know, from getting budget to doing things. Because if we come up with something useful, we're going to get the funding and we're going to be able to go do this. So, so why not do that? Well, I, I agree with you. I totally agree with you. I totally, totally agree with you. And, and I want to just um, address one thing that you said that about the, the Marines, they strip you of everything and build you back up into what they want you to be. We, we sort of can't do that to the children, but we can immerse them. <laughs> Stop it. I saw that face. And we can Why can't we do that them. to the children? We can immerse them. I can cut them. their hair. You know? <laughs> I can give Dr. Horn a haircut. We can start from the beginning. No, we can start from the beginning. No, we love our babies. We won't do that. Um, so immersion. Okay, so the immersion of you in those that short space of time, because um, we would, I mean, I was taught that duration of frequency is very important to develop habit and if, if we don't immerse them now the issue is we have to also come up against other factors with capturing their their um so we used to have capturing their attention i'm sorry my brain went faster than my mouth um so we used to have saturday school and that's how i became immersed in commit the history of commit mm -hmm. And my okay. son did too. We went to Saturday school. That's okay. how we learned the, the comedic mathematical system was Saturday school, not the regular school day. 
Mm -hmm. um, we went on Saturdays and we got immersed in certain things um, because many of the parents don't know, the teachers don't know. Uh, you, you see what I'm saying? So you're up against that factor, lack of knowledge. But I, I, I like to get to the little babies and just plant a seed mm -hmm. and cause they want to know. You see their eyes light up. Um, I, I'd like to just plant seeds with the children because some of the adults are never going to move from where they are and you're wasting your energy, wasting your time with them. You give them the information to move on if they don't respond because I'm going to tell you, they, 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 the babies are the future. That's who we need to really focus on. And if we could pull some programs together that are engaging, learning with fun and, and, and pull them in that way, um, you know, we have, what's that guy said? What's that Pope said? Give me a, a, a child from birth to eight and I give you a Catholic for life, right? <laughs> so we got to catch them young. Yeah, we got to catch them young. And but I think what we could do, what, by the way, and building on that is that uh, what, are, what are the children learning right now? They're learning right now that uh, they can learn distancy on Zoom and things like that. So maybe yeah. what we do is develop the curriculum and we say for the VI Triple C, let's put culture and use technology and have them go exactly. to Saturday school, night school, but they can learn as lifelong learners that when they want to learn about who they are and their culture and about leadership and principles, they can always go to VI Triple C and there's this whole library of stuff that they can, instead of YouTube, they can just go there and get their fix on culture. They say, okay, Dr. Horn on boom, Dr. You know, and, 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 and put together this thing that says, we want to learn what they're learning. If I take my eight year old uh, grandson, uh, Caleb, now he, <laughs> he struggled, okay? For the first, you know, X, but you know, he had his Marine grandfather and now his little butt sits in that chair and he squirms and stuff, but he's, he's engaged in learning in stuff that I would never have, you know, I taught school. Can you imagine all these little babies that are seven, eight, nine years old, sitting in a chair, looking at a Zoom screen and being able to interact and learn? Well, guess what? Mm -hmm. we, we can't lose that when they go back into the classroom and start cutting up and learning all the bad habits on the playground. We got to figure out, they have learned how to learn online. Mm -hmm. And so we have to figure out how do we learn online, Dr. Yeah. Chen, and, and put this thing together that says we have this powerful way with mastery or whatever to say, how can we have that powerful thing? Because then when you go to the University of the Virgin Islands and you want to be somebody, I want to learn about myself, you go down to the cultural center and you say, okay, how can I keep learning? Mm -hmm. So instead of going to TED Talks and trying to be entertained some, some other way, they can say, hey, you know what? We have all these really interesting people and quips that we can, we can do. Anyway, I'm getting excited about, about this panel and meeting all of you and uh, the, the forum. So you got to hit me with a hammer or just put me on mute from, uh, from no, your end. What I'm going to do, I'm going to do better because first I want to just give a round of applause to everyone for just making this symposium successful. This is our, just to be able to keep the, the consistency of doing this work at the VRCCC, we're eternally grateful because it's not easy so i'll pause with a couple of things because i you know have to deal with our sponsor slash program coordinator slash all of the administration here so i want to just kind of highlight my my gratefulness for everyone's commentary if every and just while i'm reading these things i want you to be in reflection because we're at our closing time we want to at least use the next um, seven to 10 minutes to close. And I'd like for everyone to give like a 60 second, no more than 90 second close out in terms of the charge or just your reflection or what you just would like to share with our listening and viewing audience after I read these particular pieces. So I wanna share a quotation from the president of the University of the Virgin Islands, Dr. David Hall. And this is gonna, and I'll tell the year it was said after I read it. The University of the Virgin Islands is deeply and authentically committed to ensuring that the unique cultures and heritages of the US Virgin Islands and the wider Caribbean are researched, compiled, cultivated, and disseminated broadly. This should always be a core responsibility of a university situated within a social and cultural context 
as UBI. The University of the Virgin Islands, again, is deeply and authentically committed to ensuring that the unique cultures and heritages of the US Virgin Islands and the wider Caribbean are researched, compiled, cultivated, and disseminated broadly, unquote. And that is coming from UBI President Dr. David Hall. He shared this in September 2012, which was at an ideas and issues conference that was the precursor to the actual formal launch of the Virgin Islands Caribbean Cultural Center in November on the University St. Thomas campus during the 15th annual International Islands in Between Conference hosted on the St. Thomas campus, November 9th. 2012. I just want to give some context. Another piece that I need to make sure that I share in the context of what has been offered here as part of my closing remarks from what everyone has been sharing is that the VICCC collaboratively serves as a liaison designated to create a reservoir of resources and initiatives for faculty, students, administration, staff, and the community to maintain and sustain access to materials that nurture, preserve, research, document, restore, promote, protect, and respect Virgin Islands and Caribbean culture. That is part of the mission and vision of the VICCC that's available at the viccc.ubi.edu. Really simple, right? The other piece that's really important is this particular quote when I was mentioning Dr. Didicus Jules as a former director of the Caribbean Examinations Council. And this is coming from a 2011 quote in his article around rethinking Caribbean education. And I'm just using a portion, quote, if we say that the purpose of Caribbean education is to produce the ideal Caribbean person and that this person should have the ability to learn, to be, to do, and to live together, then our assessment processes must reflect these competencies and attributes. Assessment can no longer simply be a test of academic ability or retention of knowledge. It must attest that the candidate demonstrates the knowledge, skills, and competencies reflective of the total person. Really, unquote. I want to highlight that's not me speaking. I'm pulling from what Dr. David Hall, UBI president, said. I'm pulling from what Dr. Didicus Jules, former director of, C of the CXC, said. Right, and I'm gonna bring something that really is gonna take it to another level as well, because I think it's really important for us to share some reflections that are very VI, Caribbean, American, African, indigenous, Eurasian, all of that, right? So that we're really comprehensive. This one is gonna really get you though, this is a great one. There is a talent entrusted to you it is your duty to call into action the highest forms of your being. It does not matter what your calling may be, whether it be what men call menial or what the world calls honorable, whether it be to speak in the halls of Congress or to sweep out those halls, whether it be to wait upon others or to be waited on. It is the manner of using your faculties that will determine the result. That will determine your true influence in this world and your status in this world to come. Everyone should do his part to advance humanity. Each should exert himself to be a helper in progress. Whatever your condition, you do occupy some room in the world. What are you doing to make return for the room you occupy? There are so many of our people who fail to realize their responsibility who fail to hear the inspiring call of the past and the prophetic call of the future. That's said by the Honorable Reverend Dr. Edward Wilmot Blyden, born in St. Thomas, Virgin Islands, that mm -hmm. everybody in the rest of the world is giving praise and recognition and honor to, that we tend 
to not even incorporate his knowledge system, his publications, his great international works, much less his example as a true African global Renaissance man. I'm just adding that to the conversation because that's part of the reason why when we started, the intention was to bring in this educational piece, talk about the heritage piece. How do we deal with incorporating culture? Culture has many definitions to many people. And there are publications, all of us on this Zoom symposium can speak in, for the next seven years on different elements of our publications, our work, our seminars, our, con our conferences, our programs, our lectures around culture. Culture is life. Culture is what you speak, smell, think, do, behave, mm -hmm. exemplify, live, worship, recreate, recreate, whatever term. Culture is life. And until, until we're comfortable enough to have those types of conversations, it'll end up just being kind of like a Barbie doll on a pedestal looking beautiful instead of it being what each and every one of you said today. Every single one of you gave proactive, implementable, direct, virtuous, disciplined, strategic, comprehensive recommendations on what to do. So I am very grateful. I am really, really very grateful. And on behalf of the Virgin Islands Caribbean Cultural Center, nestled inside of the College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences at the University of the Virgin Islands, the only historically black college and university in the Caribbean and a land grant institution, I really would like to just give my hand to each and every one of you, each and every one of you. And with that, before we do the turn off, stop the recording and all of that, because persons that are on Facebook, we hope that you're putting your questions, you have opportunities to share, but I'm gonna go in the order in which we started so that everybody can give their, their final charge, reflections, call out, commentary. Don't make me time you, 60 to 90 seconds, please. I, I yield my, uh, my time to the rest of the, the, the group. It's been a wonderful uh, time of sharing and reflection. I'd just like us to remember that uh, it's not just as uh, educators uh, what, um, what we hope to teach and how we hope to train others. But uh, I think today was a good experience for me in learning how do I, how do I learn and how do I uh, reassess uh, the opportunities in front of us. So what we do is important and what we do makes a difference. Thanks for being a part of this symposium. Thank you so much, Brother John Clendenin. And the next person is Director Peterson. Me? Yes. Oh, <laughs> um, yes, I really enjoyed it. And I actually see something that we can start right away. Um, the Beyond Vision just uh, got approval to open um, a community center, which has um, 147 uh, rental units over 500 residents. And we're gonna do this in partnership with, uh, with Family Voices, USVI, the VIDD Council, and UVI Triple C. So I think this is a, a real golden opportunity to uh, work with this community and to see how we can use it as one of our demonstration projects to, uh, to work on incorporating what we're talking about with the youth Yay! and the families that we have there. <laughs> Oh, well, you know, we, we're not afraid to work on this side. So we're looking forward. We're giving thanks. Dr. David Horn. Two things in reflecting on what the Colonel and Professor Glendennan said. If I, as a young person, believe I'm from nothing, then there is no problem in my acting in a negative way because I have, I'm not from anybody. I'm not from some group that's done anything. 
that is a typical belief among a lot of youth. The second thing is you're mentioning that the VICCC is about cultural collaboration, about not cultural competition, which is what we have been trained to deal with, but about let us connect the cultures, let us appreciate what people have brought forth. The last thing, what part of what we are trying to do in the um, in the upper 48 or lower 48, however you want to call it, is to, <laughs> is to get African folk who live in the United States at least to start remembering what mother wit is. Our hmm. mothers taught us how to conduct ourselves in public. They gave us that foundation. We had the nursery rhymes, we had the cooking stuff, we had the, the clothing. We don't do that anymore. Mother wit means nothing. People just go out and act the damn fool. We are trying to find a way of recapturing that. Thank you very much for allowing me to participate with this fine group of folk. And I've learned a lot. I don't know how much you've learned. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Hahn. And Sister Queen Mother Cleo Mary Abut Mutumu Jarvis. Oh, thank you so much. I enjoyed myself. I, I, I was worried, but I really enjoyed myself. I love these folks on this panel. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I do. Uh, um, so we, you know, just to veggie back on what was just said. Um, we used to give children lap time, sit them on the lap, talk to them, take them yeah. here. This is how we cook. This is how I learned to measure in the kitchen with my grandma, you know, telling me here, cut this piece of cloth three inches or whatever. You know, you learn to do, you learn your schoolwork by doing things at home. So the lap time, you're very correct. Lap time is not something that's happening now because people work in two and three jobs to buy things for their children, um, as opposed to giving them the lap time. Um, so I'm going to um, leave with just with this. Um, in my classroom, I used to use Kwanzaa principles to run my classroom. That was my classroom management. And one of the things I had my students say was, I am royalty. Yeah. I behave as royalty. I will leave wherever I go better than I met it. There you go. I carry my, cult I carry my culture with me. Right. Wherever I go. And and saying that they, I can say that group of children, none of them have ever been to prison. Give thanks and praise. I told them, you're not a dressed up dummy in Macy's store window, you are royalty. Oh, and shit. you're expected to behave that way. If we don't charge them, we, <laughs> I mean, anybody else will come along and charge them. Right. So, you know, so that was my charge for my babies and they did very well. I'm so proud of them. Wow. <laughs> So everyone, my I, little cubs in the bush. Woo, woo. <laughs> I, again, I say thank you to everyone. You brought up some really wonderful solutions. I know that everyone knows that the emails will follow shortly, and our next planning <laughs> strategy session will happen, of course, after January 4th. We're respecting this time of family and reflection and community. This has been a wonderful way to really honor also the work that's being done at the VICCC with each of you and an extension of persons that may not be on this call right now, but that they know who they are, that have provided support from pre-November November 9th, 2012 to present. I really am grateful. I would be remiss if I did not highlight that my family has allowed me the flexibility to do a lot of this, so I always give Praise and thanks to my family, you know, my beloved husband, Nusu Nepkara Asar Hedi Shetakaheru. I'm really always grateful that the freedom of engagement allows for me to do that. My children, you know, each of them from Anubi to Anawa to Akeru to Anupata to Anuma'at to Anutmeri. And now I got to start memorizing all the name of the grandchildren. So I am really <laughs> grateful. 
um, in, <laughs> that regard, in that Lucky regard, you. you know, and to all of the organizational entities that each of you, you know, represent, because it allowed, this is what we talk about when we're getting ready to go into the seventh year of the International Decade for People of African Descent. Again, a United Nations designation from January 2015 to December 2024 with a theme of recognition, justice, and development for people of African descent. Everything we spoke of here navigates right into that. The fact that the African Union is, has designated the year 2021 as the International Year for Art, Culture, and Heritage, you know what we just discussed must have been the precursor to the preliminary session of what's <laughs> happening in 2021 because every single one of you knowing that or not already established and shared a, a practical huh you already did this so it's just a matter of us moving it to the next level of unconditional prosperous successfulness as we keep doing this work and truly speaking truth to power by taking action with the truth to power in which we speak. So I'm really, really thankful. You know, I have to, and I know he's been listening, but I did not hear him, but Professor Olasi Davis, who was with the University of the Virgin Islands for more than 30 years as, you know, working in the Cooperative Extension Service, doing significant research, and of course, within now the new school of agriculture, that's a whole other conversation, he was kind enough to start this morning of cooperative economics ujama of the fourth day of kwanzaa with a really powerful heritage hike up to mount eagle and it was a gentle one because as you can see i'm sitting i am not sore i'm not scringing after walking from seven o'clock this morning until shortly before we started this particular symposium but what we saw being in nature and gaining that vitamin D, feeling those tropical breezes and the tropical sun and having discussions with persons properly physical distance, masks in place, we were able to do another layer of how we use our heritage hikes as part of our cultural heritage education programs at the VICCC as well. And it was amazing. So that is the kind of energy that is being shared here I'm eternally grateful. I can only say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'm looking forward to the next time that all of us get a chance to come together. Brother Yasha, thank you for being here and giving words, sound, power, and strength, and spirit, and vibration. You are representing Rastafari, which has always been part of that support in the work that we are doing, You know, whether it's at the university, in the community, whether it's for holding up strength for our brethren and sisters that are losing their way and need some guidance and support. I want to thank you, elder brother Yasha, for just coming and being part of this, this gathering as well. Give thanks. Give thanks. Yes, give thanks. Give thanks. Bless it. Bless it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So with yes. that family, um, I want to say, remember, culture heals humanity. Land is our foundation. And spiritual harmony unifies yes. us. I am so grateful and I'm looking forward to the next layer of when we keep building up the Virgin Islands Caribbean Cultural Center. Again, part of the College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences at the University of the Virgin Islands, the only historically black college and university and the HBCU yeah, and a land grant <laughs> institution. So everyone have a blessed season. Happy New Year to all. If you need more information or have questions, please reach out to us vi.c.ubi.edu. That's all you got to put in. Or you can email us at vi.c at live.ubi.edu. Or you can call us at 340-692-4272. We look forward to the next steps and blessings of the new year to each and every one of you. Goodbye, everybody. Take care. Peace. Peace.